Okay, I think we are ready to get started. Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this edition of Napa Valley Sessions in celebration of Premier Napa Valley. This is without a doubt the best week here in Napa. My name is Renee Airy. I'm the Duckhorn Vineyards winemaker and vice president of winemaking for our Napa Valley brands. I'm also a past winemaker chair of Premier and a member of this year's steering committee. The Napa Valley Vintners, the producers of Premier, along with myself and our fellow wine winery members, have assembled an amazing collection of 150 exclusive lots unique to the auction. The Premier auction showcases what Napa Valley is most known for, which is excellence in winemaking in the spirit of collaboration. Powered by Zaki's, the leading wine auction house, Premier opens for online bidding for members of the trade this Thursday, June 3rd, and closes via live stream auction on Saturday, June 5th at 1 p.m., and that's Pacific time. If you're a member of the wine trade, um, please take a look at the lots on our website at premiernapavalley.com. And if you're a consumer, you can go to the website to find out where to purchase wines from previous auctions. Most of the wines sold at this year's auction are from the 2019 vintage and will be released for, sa for sale in 2022. All the proceeds go to, from Premier go to the Napa Valley Vintners mission to promote, protect, and enhance our beautiful valley. To celebrate the wines, we've joined forces with three of the world's top wine critics and put together a great session, an in-depth series of looking at three different vintages. So each panel is focused on a different vintage. We'll be looking at 2018, 2019, and 2020, with today being the first part of the series. Today, we take a deep dive into the 2020 vintage. We are incredibly fortunate and thrilled to have Jeb Dunnock as our moderator for ho and host for today's panel session. An aerospace engineer by training, Jeb became interested in fine wine when living abroad and traveling through Europe. In 2008, he launched the Rhone Report, which quickly became one of the leading authorities on Rhone variety wines. Jeb was approached by Robert Parker to join the Wine Advocate in 2013. And after five years of writing full-time for the publication, he launched his own independent wine publication, jeb.com. Jeb offers comprehensive coverage of wines from California, Washington, Southern France, and Bordeaux, while seeking out discoveries from around the world. Please join me in giving Jeb a warm welcome to Premier Napa Valley. I'm gonna turn the session over to you now, Jeb, and I wish you all a wonderful Premier Week. Take care. Thank you so much, Renee, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeb, I'm, enjoy the session. Thanks so much. I'm honored to, uh, to be here today. This is my first Premier Napa Valley, so, Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. The goal of today's seminar is to help you, the trade and the consumer, to have a better understanding and to get some insight into the 2020 vintage in Napa, the newest vintage for this great region. So for the next 45 minutes, myself and, and this panel, this great panel, is are, we're here for you. There is a chat that you all have access to. I know Renee has already chatted a little bit. Connor is on there as well. Um, please ask questions. We'll do our best to answer those as we go along. We've also reserved some time at the end for a Q&A, um, but please be, be as um, vocal as you can on that chat. We want to make sure we're here and we address any questions that you have. Um, today I'm joined by a great panel. Uh, first, we're going to introduce the winemakers. We've got Julian Fayard, winemaker at Krupp Brothers. Julian trained in Bordeaux. He arrived in Napa Valley in 2006, uh, and he worked for a number of years at, with Philippe Melka as well. Next, we've got Trevor Smith. Trevor's the winemaker at Trois Noirs. Uh, Trevor's originally from Oregon. Uh, he worked in the Willamette Valley, he worked in the Barossa before settling in California's North Coast. I believe he's worked for in Sonoma as well as Napa as well. Next up, we've got Alberto Rodriguez. Uh, Berto is here from Hyde Estates in Carneros. Uh, Alberto has a great resume. He previously worked at Honig. He worked at Black Stallion, Patson Hall, Keller Estate, uh, before moving to Hyde Estates. Uh, and last but not least, we have Kathy Corson. Kathy brings an incredible depth of knowledge to the panel. I'm honored to have her here. Kathy has a master's degree in onology from UC Davis. Uh, she first started making wine in Napa Valley at Fremark Abbey in 1978. Uh, and she's been making wine under her own label since 1987. So to the panelists, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for your time. I know they all have wines to present today as well. 
And when we get into the vintage discussion, we're going to have them present their wines uh, and talk a little bit about that. What I did want to hit quickly, though, is a word about diversity in Napa Valley. And this will be important when we start thinking about the 2020 vintages as well. It's very easy to think about Napa as a single homogeneous region, but the reality couldn't be further from the truth. Napa is incredibly diverse, both in terms of its climate, both in terms of its soil, and in terms of its topography as well. Uh, you know, if we think about the climate, the valley runs north and south. The southern part of the valley, being closer to the San Pablo Bay, to the Pacific Ocean, this is cooler. This is the, the regions of this is Carneros, Coombsville, and Oak Knoll. And then as you move further north into the valley, you're going to, it gradually warms up. You get much higher daytime temperatures, but also it, you still have cool nights. Uh, and that's one reason that Napa can produce such rich, full-bodied, you know, opulent wines that still have this beautiful purity of fruit, uh, precision of aromatics. Um, and so all of that plays together. And if we look at the topography of it, really, it's incredibly diverse. You know, we have two mountain ranges. On the west, you've got the Mayakamas mountain ranges. On, on the east, you've got the Vaca, um, Mount Veter, Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain, all on the western side, very distinct regions, Mountain Terroir. And on the right, we've got Atlas Peak, Pritchard Hill, and Howe Mountain. And again, all of these are very distinctive regions. And then, of course, in the valley floor, we've got Yauntville, Oakville, Rutherford, St. Helena, and then the furthest north, Calistoga. Um, all of these AVAs, they're unique. They have their own climates. And wine make, making wine from these regions, you have to take all of that into account. So just never lose sight of the fact that Napa is made up of many different regions and different terroirs. And lastly, just before we jump in with the winemakers, to give you a, a little bit of a context for the vintage at a high level, 2020, this was a, a vintage that started out cool and mild through the spring and into the summer. It gradually warmed up going into August. There were some notable heat spikes uh, in August, uh, Labor Day, and in September as well. And then two defining fires. They have the LNU fire on August 17th. Uh, and the glass fire on September 27th. Um, we're going to address the fires kind of at a separate part, kind of later in this seminar. So we will unquestionably address that. But it's important for you to realize that there is still a harvest, and wine will make it into bottle for Napa 2020. I'm going to kind of approach this seminar um, just to, as if I was showing up in Napa Valley and doing visits with these winemakers to try and understand the vintage. We're gonna kind of break it up into two parts. We're gonna think about the vintage in terms of kind of a earlier ripening varieties, uh, mostly from Coonsville, um, Carneros, and Oak Knoll. And that's gonna be Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, and Pinot Noir. Because uh, that's a very different vintage than the later ripening Bordeaux varieties. And so we're gonna kind of think about it in two different parts. So with that, I'm gonna jump right in and we're gonna to speak to Trevor Smith who has a Chardonnay that he has, and this is from Carneros, or where is this from, Trevor? You're... This is from Oak Knoll. Oh, for Oak Knoll, okay, so perfect. So Trevor, if you could kind of kick us off, how do you think about this vintage? And you can start in the spring. How did it go for you going into summer? What are your thoughts on 2020? Yeah, well, I'll just preface by saying, I didn't kind of come in with Tuanawa until um, a little later in the season into July, but um, kind of talking with the vineyard managers and our growers getting a sense for um, what had the vintage had kind of been like up until that point. You know, as you said, it was like the spring was, it was warm and it was dry. It was very mild. There were no real crazy heat spikes early on, really until I feel like September. Um, and then the two biggest things, or the two biggest factors that I kind of had to, was considering is, is it was early. It was looking like an earlier vintage, it was drier. Uh, and then the yields were, I think, pretty, pretty consistently across the valley, and especially for us at our vineyard that we were working with called Mira Hanna, is that uh, the yields were very low, which was um, not a, which is a very good thing. It's not, you know, not something to be concerned about. So, hey, really quick, why was that? So if it was a good early, um, it was an early year, you had a good set, why were yields down? I think, well, for our particular vineyard, some of it was just specific to that. It's kind of cyclical, like one year we had, the, in 2019, we had very high yields. And then in 2020, we were kind of anticipating a little less. And then partly just talking with growers, there had been a little bit of a early season storm with some rain and wind that kind of affected the, the set. We did have a lot of hens and chicks, which again, is ultimately is not a bad thing. 
I mean, it, I think it spoke, it, it actually ended up being very good for quality later on. So those are the two things I wanted to kind of focus on and, and look at and then going in, you know, I knew it would probably early or ripen earlier. And so just paying real close attention to that. As we got into August, we did end up kind of picking earlier than we did in 2019. Okay. And I had not worked with the vineyard before 2020. Jamie, Jamie Rahu had, who she's kind of the, she's the owner and proprietor of Tuanwa. And she kind of told me, you know, it's, um, you have to watch because your ripening curve can really swing real fast, um, especially okay. as we get some hotter days towards the end of August. So, um, but we were watching it and we pretty much got fully through uh, the season with no, with no major um, issues until, you know, the fires did start on the 17th, um, but we really didn't see any heavy smoked or impact. I know going to the pick, so we picked on August 22nd, going to that, we kind of, you know, we could actually see the fires up, you know, on the, in the, in the vodkas and see them, but, you know, Jamie and I talked this morning, like we could see, you could see the stars, you know, pick, we, we picked it midnight you could see the stars and the sky was very clear so it wasn't something with this first Chardonnay pick that we were too concerned about okay. uh, and ultimately if I had to kind of you know just sum it up like it was a it was a it was a little bit of an early vintage but it was like a classic you know it looked like a very good very high quality white wine vintage I think yeah. you know, just kind of going off markers we looked I think they started kind of picking sparkling around August 7th so that was kind of something just told us okay maybe it's coming a little earlier and so how much so I know 18 and 19 were kind of cooler vintages in general how so that is kind of uh, bias is kind of the viewpoint of being early. How much earlier was it from say, uh, is it like 15 early or, or 16 early? Where are we at? I mean, really for um, what I can say is it was in 2019, we had picked, I think, August 29th. And then in then 2020, we picked August 22nd. So okay. it was maybe a week to 10 days for this specific site. Again, I feel like it's probably different from place to place. So, um, but that's kind of what we were dealing with and that, that was pretty consistent along with all the different blocks we picked throughout. Got it. Hey, Alberto, I'm going to bring you in as well, if you would, because you're in Carneros. Did you see, That's right. <clears throat> how did the spring start for you as well? Did you see a similar type of uh, uh, questionable set that affected yields or no? Yeah, you, uh, you know, uh, since we are here in Carneros and we get this cold weather, uh, you know, things a little bit, uh, cause some problems early on. We have a little bit of a, a frost damage um, and early on in some of the blocks, which is uh, very, not very unusual here in, in uh, Carneros. So uh, the set was fine. Uh, we didn't he see any trouble or any problems until uh, early August. Um, you know, when the heat spike, everything was just nice and smooth. We have, you know, fairly weather throughout the year. The growing season was fine, a little bit slower than other years. But, you know, there was really nothing surprising. I mean, I was very excited about the vintage. Um, honestly, uh, where we started seeing problems with, uh, with the heat spike uh, in August uh, 17, uh, I think it was like five days of really hot weather that very unusual here in Carneros. Uh, you know, we see a lot of dehydration uh, and that's when the Hennessy fire started. Uh, you know, by the time our fruit was setting on uh, around 23 bricks, I mean, we're shooting for like 24. So what, what we did is uh, we decided to pick and uh, pick a little bit earlier. I was hoping or shooting for like the end of August, uh, but we decided to pick. We didn't want to get into any other issues, you know, the hydration or, you know, the lack of the uh, uh, bricks was going to jump from 23 to 25 high alcohols. Um, so the one, uh, it's turning out really well uh, so far. So um, yeah, we, we, the hydration was one of the main problems so here. What, what drove your decision to harvest then? Was it mostly, was it the heat, heat spells that were driving that? Was it the fire <laughs> that was there? What was the primary factor in your determination to harvest? Well, the, the, the problem actor, you know, we're really kind of like low, uh, it's a Pinot Noir. I don't want to go like 25 bricks. So the, the goal is to go around 24 bricks for Pinot Noir. We want to preserve these really beautiful uh, red aromas as well as you know dark fruit. Uh, so our decision was uh, just to pick two problems: the heat spike will pretty much shut down our, our vines. Secondly, uh, you know the fire started, and you know the wind was keeping uh, uh, was uh, switching shifts from north to south, from south to north. So we started seeing some smoke coming in uh, to Carneros. So we made the right decision. We started picking uh, pretty much everything. I mean, I was, I was done by September uh, 28th with like 
the Merlot and our Syrah that we also produce. Got it. Thank you so much, Alberto. Hey, Trevor, you want to talk to us about your Chardonnay? Um, yeah, so this, it, like I said, um, came from Muir Hanna Vineyard, which is on the west side of Oak Knoll. Um, it's a block. We, we had worked with this vineyard in the past, but this particular block is not one we had. It was called H4 block. It's, um, it's, it was originally planted back in the 80s, 87, 88 on St. George and uh, AXR. Some of it got replanted to 110R as blocks were started to kind of kick in, but uh, we got, it, we got, we, it was available and we were able to work with it. We picked on August 22nd and, you know, our picking decision was based solely on like physiological ripeness flavors were great chemistry was right in the zone so we picked it we we didn't really see any kind of impact from anything else um and then our winemaking was pretty you know pretty classic in the sense we we definitely kind of we considered doing some you know treading and maybe some skin mash ration like four to six hours we decided against that just you know to kind of hedge and to make sure um and then once you know we pressed and uh went into tank we racked once and we really looked at the least closely to see again if we could notice anything bad in the solids it didn't um and then this specific specifically for the for this auction lot here um we had we decided to do two barrels indigenously where we just kind of kind of let them uh start fermenting and go on their own and um and they did and we definitely noticed the different characters as they were going through fermentation and then once they finished and going into elevage they definitely kind of had a unique character um, which we really liked uh, the block itself, H4 being from the little bit older vines, we just saw kind of more textural complexity and kind of more kind of interesting characters uh, as far as structure on the palate. Uh, and then Jamie and I decided, you know, she decided it was kind of something that we thought was special and kind of set itself apart from um, everything else to make it uh, into the auction. So if you're thinking about, so help, help read listeners understand 2020 with regards to white wine. This is a, it's a great vintage for whites. It, they, it, they're richer, they're more fresh. How would you classify and think about 2020 with regards to white wine? I would say, yeah, it's an excellent white wine vintage. I would say they tend to be a little more kind of rich and like flesh and mid palate. Um, maybe, you know, opulent for lack of a better word. Cause it was, yeah. there was like Alberto mentioned there was some heat kind of in August, right when a lot of things were kind of coming to that peak of ripeness. So um, yeah, I would say they tend to, you know, lend themselves to richness, but again, because of the early, because of the kind of mild season early, the even growing, um, you know, there was great balance. And so there's no, like nothing kind of overblown or, or too rich, like, you know, like, especially with this older vines, good, you know, with good management, they really retain the balance, the acidity and all that. And so last question, I guess, this, cause it's really interesting for you because you have a vineyard that has Chardonnay and Cabernet, how did those, two varieties do in the vintage how do you distinguish between those was it you have to wait forever for that cabernet was what are your thoughts on your cabernet from an oak knoll site yeah it was funny because it was kind of we decided to pick up that block of cabernet right when um when we were picking one of the other the chardonnay blocks it was available we decided to go with it and taste it it seemed like a long time between picking the chardonnay and then picking the cabernet but really it was just about a month we picked it on the 19th of September and you know again it was just watching it we were able to test the Cabernet blocks the berries for skins to look if there had been any impact from smoke there wasn't or I mean depending on what they say the thresholds are so we were real happy with it again I think that's earlier than most of the other Cabernet sites but we really right. like the zone for flavor and and for I mean for us made partly based on our house style and kind of when we pick the reds tend to have like it's more of a lighter more red fruit kind of fresher style so okay awesome thank you so much Trevor Hey, Alberto, talk, talk to us about Pinot Noir. I know you have a Pinot Noir that you presented. How does Pinot Noir fare in the vintage? Yeah, our, our Pinot Noir is actually evolving really well. Uh, I'm very impressed. I think it's going to be a great vintage. Uh, talking about Pinot Noir, other than, uh, you know, we have a, a really nice uh, uh, growing season. And again, uh, heat spikes didn't uh, cause any, um, any problems. Uh, we had to peak a little bit earlier. Uh, this is the first time that I'm going to go uh, over vintage. So I'm going to let the wine uh, sit in barrels up to uh, uh, 14 months, uh, just because I want to bring back some of the meat palate that I missed uh, because of heat wave. So, you know, there's always, always ways to uh, make the best of, of a vintage, even though you, you, you face all these challenges. Uh, again, uh, you know, you had just have to make the right decisions at the right time. And it's very important, uh, you know, when you're making great wines. So uh, what we're going to do is, you know, this, this fruit came with uh, really uh, high acid, uh, 
lower bricks than, than we expected, but we're still, you know, the ones that are evolving are just maturing and I'm very happy with it. I mean, this is our 20, uh, 2020 Pinot Noir. Um, it was picked in August 20th and it's just, uh, it, it is an amazing wine. Did you see the similar type of uh, yield reduction due to the yeah, weather? Yeah, you know, you we were very happy. <laughs> To be honest, I was looking. I was I was looking at the blocks, walking the blocks, right at the beginning of August, and I was hoping to get, uh, you know, two and a half to three tons to eight, to the acre. Yeah, that was that was just before the heights, uh, uh, the heat spike. When it hit, uh, you know, the 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 yields was really low. There was a lot of dehydration in the fruit, which came down to you know some of the blocks were producing up to like one and a half tons to the acre. I mean, there was really, literally uh, less weight on on each cluster. Uh, but again, the concentration, the wine, it's just amazing. Uh, and I'm very, I'm very, very happy with uh, 2020, I think, for us, uh, including not just the Pinot Noir, but also the Chardonnay and all the other uh, varieties. They're just, you know, they're just coming along. I'm, I'm thinking 2020 is going to be just a great vintage and we'll feel lucky that, you know, we're in the Carneros area. Um, I, we're still learning about the smoke. I, I think the... Uh, the intensity of the smoke as, uh, you know, if you're not closer to the fires, I don't think the impact is as hard as it is when you're closer to the fires. You know, we get all this wind from the San Pablo Bay, which helps a lot, uh, you know, and uh, it is just, it is just great to be here. Great. Thank you so much, Alberto. I appreciate it. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to go into the later ripening varieties uh, and we're going to speak with more with Julian and Kathy. Uh, can you guys, Julian, we'll start with you. How do you kind of approach this vintage looking back? You know, what do you remember about this vintage uh, starting with the spring, going into the summer and kind of like the uh, high level overview for you? Yeah, the, the high level overview of the vintage was a, a basically a vintage that is very steady, a little bit on the colder side, which I like for Napa Valley because I think one of the main thing we, we fight here is heat and over ripeness. And seeing a vintage that installs itself in a in kind of a long season with a slow pace is really good. Well, we were, you know, variation, usually I measure with variation or with picking for the sparkling, but you know, early August. Um, and that's a good good timing. Um, what, normally, because so Julian, you work with throughout the valley, right? I mean, you have plots north, south, kind of everywhere. So it's great to have your perspective on that. Verasion in general was ahead of schedule, behind schedule. Where did that come in? Not looking really at a cool vintage, but kind of a, from an average uh, perspective. I think we're right in the middle. For, but we, I don't know what we can call normal vintage, but right. on the average, if we do a rolling average, we're right in, in the middle, maybe on the later side. But like sites like stagecoaches that were up in the hills were a little bit colder and a little bit behind. And some years are ahead, some years are behind, you know. So you start to change uh, regions that way uh, on the pack and also varietals like the Tiverdo can be early or it can be late depending on the season. It's really how the, you know, every season you almost know where you place it and work with that. Um, but I, I was starting, I and mean, I think um, uh, Oza has mentioned it, but it started to install itself in a beautiful vintage pre uneventful too, because um, I always count it as strikes, you know, uh, every time you get a little bit of hail, cold, and then rain or heat spikes, you damage the vintage a little bit. But uh, what we saw with the heat spikes in August and September was a really good recovery of the vineyards and really strong canopy, really good vine health. And that's uh, benefiting from a uh, strong early season. Um, we see that a little bit this year as well. You know, we have a lot of wind and we have a cooling pattern on that side. Um, so I just hope we can uh, redo 2020 with a little bit of, uh, you know, more uh, quiet finish. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you, so we, we've talked, we've had three people now talk about heat spikes. Does anybody know the exact dates for the first one in August? Yeah, the first one came uh, right on uh, mid, uh, mid August. It was actually uh, started on uh, August 17 and it was for five days. Uh, you know, I spoke with our vineyard manager and, uh, and Chris Hyde and I said, look, uh, this, is, uh, this is very unusual for, for Carneros. We're gonna get, you know, maybe we'll hit the three digits, which we did a couple of days. And I said, look, uh, you know, I was in a schedule to pick later. And uh, I said, look, if, if we really get to the three digits, we might have to pick. 
And yeah, uh, you know, uh, it hit the three digits. It actually went to like 105, 105 on August uh, 19th, right. which that's, that's when I decided just to go ahead and, and start picking our, all our fruit. Got it. So Julian, so, you know, I looked at the graph for the temperature and it looked like it went over 100 just a few times. So I know we were talking about heat spikes, but are we talking about like the level of 2017? I mean, how, how impactful were these heat spikes? So I think there is very little damage. Uh, we, we protect the blocks that needs protection that on regular get sunburned. For me, uh, the exposure to heat and the sunburn degrades quality in the fruit uh, very much. So usually we have either canopy work or shade cloths that are uh, done there. Um, my whites, you know, we do a little bit of Viognier for crop. We do uh, Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc. Usually I, I, I mean, my strategy is we have time to ripen those. So we always leave a little bit too much canopy because I know we're gonna get in our sun. Uh, and those sites are pretty rocky and they ripen really well. So it's not a challenge to get there. Um, 17, we can talk about it with the cabs, also in the winemaking strategy. I think that's where we learned a lot. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, we'll, we, we'll hit 17 another time. Kathy, I want to kind of bring you in here and, and your high level thoughts about 2020. Well, here, here on the bench land between Rutherford and St. Helena, we did have some cool weather and a little bit of rain in May, right about flowering time. And so that for us, that's why the vintage was small. Um, so we went forward with a very cool season up until the middle of August. And I think that informs the vintage hugely. Um, when we talk about heat spikes, we've got to talk about the vines, the age of the vines, the rootstock, the cyan. They all react differently to heat. Um, our Kronos Vineyard is 50 years old this year and it's on St. George rootstock. And those gnarly old ladies just sail through heat spikes. So yes, it, it got quite hot, but the vines were in really good shape. I think Julian mentioned that. So for me, harvest was pretty much on average. We, we generally picked the second week in September and we did in 2020 um, before the, the later heat spikes. So um, for me, it was, it was a beautiful season. I'm seeing a lot of concentration in the wines because of the smaller crop. And at least the start of the season was very long and cool. So good natural acidity, terrific flavors. So when you start, when you think about the vintage then, Kathy, do you think this is a moderate year? Was it cool, hot? I mean, kind of how do you, just at a high level, somebody say, oh, it was a warm year. It was a cool year. How do, where does it fall? It was warmer than average, I would say. Uh, my very favorite vintages are always the longest, coolest. So to the extent that this vintage was long and cool before the spikes, that was good for flavor development and structure. But it was it was a warm, a warm vintage, I would say. Got it. And did you see any, actually maybe this is a question better for, for Julian since you work in so many different parts of the valley. Julian, was it a, was it a vintage that favored certain terroirs, certain soils, altitude? Um, no, I think it's it's been overall pretty consistent throughout the valley. I think, and uh, my strategy has been to pick independently of the fire events because um, what Katie is saying, I think we had this had cool start and those heat spikes in August kind of were an accelerator, but we were borrowing from a little bit of potential from that average uh, start uh, or little coolers and normal. Um, it's it's basically, uh, you know, I, I always look in balance. You know, it's it's if if you if you borrow on one end, you have a little more news. And like 2015, for example, we're in early cycle, fairly ripe, and then we push through and ripen really fast at the end with the heat waves. And then that gives wines that were super sweet. You know, the colors were not as dense, and and people love those wines. But it's a texture. I don't know about the edibility. We're not cold like a 2010 or 2011 or 2000 vintage that were really uh, installing themselves, especially in the end of season. Uh, here, we had a little bit of vintage catching up at the end uh, and giving us in-house ripeness. And you see darkness, fruit, black intensity in the wines throughout the valley. And I don't think there was any vintage where, um, you know, 
or any sites where the vintage has been uh, uh, way beyond. It's, it was actually installing itself in a very peaceful, easy to work with vintage where we could give time to each vineyard to ripen Got it. at space. So. All right, so, so uh, Julian and Kathy then, thinking about harvest, the fires arrive, what was the primary factor in when you harvested your grapes? Um, for me, I'm sorry. No, you, for both of you, go, 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 go. whoever wants to go. Well, for me, the picking decisions didn't have anything to do with the fires. It, we, we picked when it was time to pick and that it was normal in the second week in September. And for us, um, we, the, the first fires here in the Napa Valley ignited in the Eastern Hills and then the north winds sent them south and east. And so we had very little effect from the LNU fire here in the center of the valley. Um, it was the, the glass fire was the one that was on both sides of the valley and really affected the entire Napa Valley. Um, there was a third fire that wasn't in the Napa Valley, but was up in Redding. And that smoke was sent straight down to us and it darkened our skies. But because the fire was so far away, the smoke was very high and it was very old. So it, there were a lot of particulates in the air, but there were very few volatile phenols. You couldn't smell the smoky sm smell. Got it. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. And so Julian, for you, what was kind of the driving factor then for determining when to bring in your grapes? Yeah, so that's, uh, first we ran a lot of lab and we, we tested, micro-fermented and tested grapes and micro-ferments from each block. And we had time to do that. The labs were really backed up. But basically what we learned in 17.2 is there's not really a, a one size fits all or a really good predictable. I mean, if you're really close to the fire and, um, you know, smell and have those phenol directly on the on the grapes. You you're gonna smell it in the vineyard. You're gonna smell and it's gonna smell the wine and I think it's toasted. But the effect of what we call sm cold smoke or smoke that falls a little later is very heterogeneous. It depends on varietals greatly and sites. And for example, with Scrub Brothers, it's uh, the stagecoach uh, got really close to the fire, and all those fruit we picked. I think two blocks out of all our blocks and. Uh, it was more out of favor and also trying because we're working with those blocks year to year. Um, but basically the smoke impacts is really strong. Um, when we're in Coombsville where we're different wind patterns a little further from the fires, we had a lot less impact. And after, for me, the rule of thumb is let's stick with our uh, plan for extraction because the type of wines we make in Napa, especially, I think that's a more general observation, but the richness, the texture and the concentration helps integrate with those effects. And if you are at a low level or minimal level, you will not uh, smell it in the white. Um, after it really goes down to what type of wine you make and for who and how you sell it. And I think the consumers that expect, uh, you know, have been consumers for years and used to a certain style, certain aromatics from the sites and the wines, you know, will be questioning you when they open the, those wines, and especially when they start to compare their vintage to vintage. And the, the decision made early on in the way to pick is we're not picking for single vineyards most of the times. I think that's maybe something that will come out of 2020 is none of the single vineyards will be produced, but we'll produce some of the cabs, uh, especially, I mean, I sent you a sample of the cab we have from Crop and the aromatics is beautiful, the nose is beautiful. We're still observing the wine. We're gonna give it its full length, uh, make sure we're stable. We still have that consistency. And so when, when people taste those wines, they have no surprise. So I guess then this is a great um, segue into, let's actually talk as much as we can about the fires. So there were two fires. You had LNU August 17th. Looks like a little bit of the, of the whites and the Pinots were brought in during that time. The, Literally, that was during, you know, the smoke effect from that was during Verasion. So there was, you know, a decent amount of smoke in the valley and then the glass fire, which was so damaging. And I think that was more of the direct fires near vineyards and that really young smoke. So I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts here. Um, how did these fires affect you? Did they alter how you made your wines? Um, and what decisions did you make in 2020 when trying to decide about releasing a, a wine? Because you know, as we know, the insidious part about uh, smoke contamination 
is that it can hide itself. It can be, it's volatile and then it can be non-volatile because it can bind in the grapes and then come out later. And so how do we approach this from you as a winemaker and how should consumers approach this? Trevor, we'll, we'll start with you. We'll just, we'll just do, if we could go quickly, we'll kind of go around all these. It'd be great to have everybody's kind of high level thoughts on this. And we'll finish with Kathy. I think she, we spoke earlier and she has a great summary for this. Yeah, I mean, as Kathy said, like Ellen and you was, it was a much larger fire over a much larger area. Um, and so the, like the density and the concentration of smoke was different. And again, there's just so many facts, you know, the age of a, you know, if a smoke is more than two days old, it might, you know, the volatile phenols that might get on the skins or in berries, you know, those are often gone by that point. So there's just so many factors to look at. All of our fruit, including reds, was picked before glass. You know, glass was so damaging because, you know, LNU was 300 and 360,000 acres at, you know, and uh, over kind of a big area and the smoke went way up, whereas the glass fire was, you know, 60,000 acres. And I think both of them kind of burned a similar amount of uh, buildings and things. And then that's another factor looking at like, what was the combustible fuel? Was it oak, savanna and grass or was it buildings and stuff? And so all those factors play into it. You know, and the biggest thing for us is we were just, you know, vigilant. We, we tested where we could, if the labs could get results, we went on that. You know, we did micro ferments and did sensor if we couldn't and just kind of, you know, watch very closely, maybe a little less time on skins, but, you know, some of the compounds they're testing for, you know, like they're found in like, they show up in varietal Syrah or they show up from, you know, toast from various cooperages. So, or just, you but know. Do you, do you think testing is an effective way to address this th or no? It, it shows you a, a slice of it. I don't think it's a hundred percent. And there's, again, there's things, and even just getting the, um, experts to kind of agree on what a threshold is was something we're all kind of learning and so it's kind of been a learning process a lot of the research is from 08 or from the AWRI in Australia and so you just kind of find it figuring out and fine-tuning what those numbers and things mean here and I will say um, from this last year there is a lot of data to you know go through and look and start to learn about it but for us specifically we feel real good about um, you know we, we were all in before the glass fire and you know just watching being vigilant and paying attention and seeing if it starts to develop in barrel and things like that. So that's what we're doing. Got it. Thank you so much, Trevor. Hey, Alberto, what are your thoughts on the fires and how they affected you specifically think that you're so far south in the valley? Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, uh, uh, we're not very concerned about the fires. Uh, in fact, uh, we don't have really, we're not surrounded with mountains. So it is really more about uh, the uh, climate change, uh, what is actually bringing a little bit of uh, you know, uh, changes to the valley, the way that fruit is maturing, how fast is, is maturing and all that. Uh, so in any way, uh, we are concerned with smoke taint uh, in, in any way. Um, we are actually uh, testing our wines and basically come with a very, very low levels of uh, smoke taint, which it can come from the barrels. Uh, you know, I, I kind of like do, uh, did a lot of searching and I, actually call ETS and find out uh, what did, what these numbers, it was a concerning number, which, you know, it came back with, you know, uh, the smoke really doesn't impact much here in Carneros because the way, uh, the wind we get from the, uh, from the ocean, uh, <clears throat> you know, for the St. Pablo Bay and get mixed with the, with the, uh, with the um, smoke, uh, in any way, uh, we are more concerned, again, uh, about weather change, and we work with Mother Nature, always making the right decisions, you know, in our vineyards. We, we really hardly uh, work in our vineyards throughout the whole year, throughout the whole uh, the, the, um, growth uh, season. And we always try to make the, the right decisions. Uh, again, um, you know, there's, we're not surrounded with mountains, so we are, uh, but we are having, uh, paying a lot of attention to our vineyards. And, uh, you know, it is, it is a tough decision. Uh, I feel for those guys that are more up the valley uh, where they're, uh, you know, they're smart mountains and then, uh, you know, they have more fires. Okay. So, yeah. Great. So, Julian, that, uh, really quick, we'd love to hear your thoughts because you have such a, a wide view of the, the vintage as well. LNU, glass fires. Yes. Um, so, for me, there's two. There's there's two effects. There's the effects that damage you. You have no control over fire and smoke, basically. I mean, there's very little we can do in the vineyards to do it. And if you're subject to fire, some estates have been just punched, fire went through it, you, you have no chance to have a solution or anything. Um, with, uh, is that, that was, you know, 
that was the question after because we get basked in the smoke um, coming from the north, we, we, you know, all the Sonoma fires. And it, it starts to work on the mental and the moral of people and starting to question something that we have very little control over. I mean, you wake up in the morning, the smoke's sitting there with the cold air sits on the ground and you know the consequence can have. So you start to question the quality of the fruit. We also work, I think all of us uh, and at large in Napa with very, very expensive vineyards, very, very expensive fruit. So um, you question the capacity of those fruit and the value of those fruit of being able to produce the wine that you expect. And I think that's when uh, a lot of, uh, there is uh, one of the person asking a question about many wineries saying they won't release the wine. I think early on there was, um, you know, all the Pritchard Hill get affected and a lot of people stop picking cancel picking and cancel production. And because there is a level of expectation that is not gonna get there. And so it was an easy call. That started a snowball, I think, on people that cancel venues where they had no understanding of the real extent of the impact. And there is vineyards I pick in two or three passes in the block. And you can see the more it's sat in the smoke, the more smoke impact there is in the wine. But there is also a research of a certain concentration certain richness there was also discussions to be have with the uh, farmers you know it's a livelihood and it's long-term relationship we have and so um every, i think every single that was the hard the really hard part is to discuss with each vineyard each farmer the relationship and how you wanted to handle some people had insurance some people right. sat on it some people we picked and we figured out later some we paid contract price um, every single case has been addressed and that was the bulk of the work was really making sure we're taking the decision that is right for the relationship with the farmers to be able to continue, you know, I mean, year after year and it's behind it's also a business, you know, we, we see winemakers as people that produce quality, but you have to care for the health of the wine programs and the health, the financial health of it. And, and that's in those times that you take a decision that's gonna have an impact at two or three years. If you start to lose contract because you disagree with a farmer, you're not gonna have those single vineyards and those single special sites. And that's really, really where the smoke creates a stress. Thank you so much, Julian. Kathy, I'm gonna give you the last word on that. If you would, your, your thoughts kind of the fires effect and, and how everyone should think about the fires. Well, first of all, if I've learned anything is to not jump to conclusions. There are many vintages like the 2011 that many people wrote off and there are beautiful wines made in 2011. It was a challenging vintage, but there are many, many beautiful wines. So I think the first thing is to not, not paint everything with a broad brush because the Napa Valley is so diverse, but it's also to not jump to conclusions. We really don't know. We won't be bottling the Cabernets for another year. I can speak to, I can only speak to my little corner of the world here. And stylistically, I pick weeks before many. So, so my grapes had been in for two and a half weeks by the time the glass fire hit. Our biggest challenge was keeping smoke out of the winery. We went, we went down to San Francisco the first day and picked up a couple of industrial grade um, HEPA filters to keep the smoke out of the winery because the wines were fermented and down to barrel. Um, but in choosing, deciding whether to pick, um, we looking ahead, we, we checked for smoke markers in the grapes and then we did mini ferments and that's because it's, it's known that the, um, the volatile phenols can disassociate from the sugars during fermentation. So we wanted to run a fermentation before we picked. The, the smoke marker numbers were very low in both the grapes and the mini ferments. So I decided to pick. And then um, I think it's a beautiful vintage. I mean, we haven't, we haven't talked about the wines, but wonderful concentration, very dark colors, um, fabulous flavors. There's another juncture after malolactic where people have found that the volatile phenols can be freed again. So I ran numbers again, this time the entire panel of volatile phenols and bound phenols after malolactic and found very, very low smoke, mark, smoke marker numbers. And more importantly, tasting the wines, 
I can't find any any effect of the smoke. So I'm very optimistic that these, this wine will make the bottle. But again, we won't be bottling for an entire year, so. All right, thank you so much, Kathy, I appreciate it. We're gonna do a quick Q&A. We're gonna be a little bit over, but we're gonna probably wrap up in five minutes. One question was from Steve, uh, Norcas, he says, perception is reality. We have customers that come into the store to buy their wine and actually say they are stocking up because they don't want to buy smoky wine, as they say. We also have customers that tell us they aren't planning to buy 2020s at all. I think we need to get as much usable information to the public that they know and understand that is not all damaged. Is there a way that you, you give that information out? Or is that what you're doing today? Or is there a way to communicate that? The proof is going to be in the pudding, you know? The but that's, that's what we need to do. We all need to do the very best we can and be very careful about putting only top wine in the bottle. And we have a long history of doing that. And I won't, I won't put this wine in the bottle unless I'm proud of it, period. I agree with, uh, I agree with Katie. I think, uh, please buy 2020 and try it and taste it. Buy a bottle and then make your mind. It, it's like 2011. So many people brought it off. There's beautiful wines. And, and it's our responsibility to make sure what goes in the bottle is gonna be exceptional and people are gonna be wowed by it. And if you see any wines with our names on it, it will be signed that it's quality in the bottle. And that's Thank really you. what Thank we Thank you very need. much, Julian. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna jump away. We have another question we have in Bordeaux. Winemakers are responding to warmer growing seasons by picking earlier extracting less, fermenting at lower temperatures for shorter periods, pumping it over and punching down less using large barrels, amphora, uh, and less new oak. Are the panelists changing their winemaking approach in reaction to changes in weather? Uh, we'll yes. Go ahead, whoever wants to start. Yeah, uh, yes, of course. Uh, you know, again, uh, like I mentioned before, we work with Mother Nature. There's years where you can uh, do more extraction uh, in the uh, in the wine, and there's there's years you know colder years you have to do uh, uh, more extraction. Hotter years you have to do less less extraction. Uh, you know again here at Hyde uh, we're not we're not married. We don't have a recipe. We work with Mother Nature, and as uh, Mother Nature give us the fruit, uh, we play with it. We do, uh, we make the best decisions. Uh, we have uh, tanks designated for our fruit, which they can last up to uh, 30 days in mm -hmm. tank if it's necessary. Uh, we have the barrel aging. Uh, we have, there's a lot of things that we can do, uh, you know, during the aging process uh, to be consistent on the wines. So yeah, we, uh, the, the, um, the climate change has played a big role uh, in the world of wine. And uh, we are learning a lot of things. Uh, so uh, we're doing a lot of farming practices. We're doing uh, a lot of things in our, uh, in our vineyard uh, to uh, work with that. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else have like to comment on that? Mother Nature, a... oh, okay. Mother Nature throws us something different every year. 2020 is no exception and so we need to be nimble and make the wine given the grapes where we get that year. So I would say we're, we're tweaking what we do every year. I can't say as I'm changed my winemaking at all, overall, um, I, but I, I need to pay attention to the vintage. Got it. So that's a great lead into this next question is that is climate change driving a change in varietal composition of vineyards? Uh, away from say early ripening varieties such as Merlot towards uh, more Cabernet. I think we see it in um, like areas like Calistoga a little bit not more where it's extreme, but I think uh, Cabernet is uh, said to be to be um, kind of the reference in Napa. It's not going to change for a while. Um, it's also I think we we had a race for efficiency in the vineyards. To have a maximum exposure, you know, a perfect canopy, very clean um, uh, rootstock and, and um, plant material. And I think we need to learn to dial back that because sometimes one of the main problem is the, the sugar production versus the phenolic cycle. And that's why I like those cold, uh, slow years because uh, the two cycles tends to uh, go back in, um, in, in sync. And to overlay this question with the previous one, 
Um, I think for Napa, we're still uh, looking at our identity and refining this. Uh, we, we had a, a race for power and concentration, and now we're going with more nose flavor aromatics. Bordeaux, I find every time I go to be riper and riper. And also there is some identity crisis uh, where people start to look outside the box and start to change the winemaking practices to create new flavors, new profiles. So I think you have to distinguish sometimes what's linked to weather and what's linked to basically winemakers trying to get out of the normal sea and, and to uh, be creative and invent. We're always changing. Um, there is a, an average, let's say, well, uh, in every day, but it's in interesting to see that creativity. And even in this panel, there's such a different vari um, range of winemakers and style. And I think they all co coexist. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to do one more question. I think we're going to wrap it up because we're a little bit over. Do you think that the price of fruit in Napa is a hindrance to accessibility for both young consumers and young winemakers? Is there any way to give them a foothold from which to begin? Do you see any way to prevent family farms from being bought off their land? So, so Kathy, this would be a great, since you have such a, a view of the valley, I mean, how do you view the change in cost of fruit that you've seen over your time? So well, there's no question that my little business would be threatened by the price of fruit, which is directly linked to the price of land, if we hadn't had the great fortune to acquire some of our own vineyard. Um, so it is a huge challenge. I think looking forward for the Napa Valley, um, I'm hopeful if we all are still farmers, we're going to be okay. That's my biggest concern is that we, I can't make the wine any better than the grapes that come in the door. And so I spend most of my time out there. So um, the second our farming becomes industrial, um, I think we will lose our edge. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think with that, we're going to wrap up the seminar. We're just a little bit over. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the panels for their honest, uh, great opinions and for their time today. I do hope all the consumers and everybody watching uh, got some insight, uh, some knowledge on how to approach 2020, what was the vintage like, what to expect. Uh, and we'll see, as Kathy said, the proof is in the pudding and uh, we'll see how it comes out. So thank you so much, everyone.